Welcome back, my dear friends, to what I consider to be one of the most terrifying stories I've ever read. Now, if you join me on Monday, you'll have already heard the first part of this video, so I've left the timestamps in the description so you can skip ahead to the end. Now, originally this was a five-part story. I did the first three parts in the first video, so what you're going to listen to this evening are parts four and five. But, like I said, just consult the description for the parts you need. Okay, I put it all together to make it easy for you. Okay, my dear friends, are you ready then? Don't be too scared and remember it's only a story. But I would like you to do one thing for me. I want you to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Growing up, I always feared monsters. Even in college, which most will consider to be the time when you can be called an adult. My greatest fears were the monsters under my bed, in the closet or at the window. I would always tell myself how silly this was, seeing as I was an adult at this point, and I was still afraid of something I knew did not exist. That was until... until I met my wife. But, before I tell you what happened... Let me elaborate on how I met my wife-to-be and how much she means to me. I met Natalie in college. I, well, I was a nerdy guy, and yet she saw something in me that no other girl in my life had. She was an extremely kind person who always had the sweetest of intentions. As I spent more time with her, I realized how many things we had in common. To me, she was the most beautiful girl in the world. I could stare into her green eyes for the rest of my life. And that's what I chose to do when I proposed and we finally got married. Fast forward to married life. I'm working now, while she is working on an online master's degree. Life is good. Life is actually perfect. Too perfect. Ever since we got married... I've told her everything, my deepest secrets, my deepest feelings, and, most importantly, my deepest fears. I remember when I first told her about my silly fear of monsters. <laughs> At first, she just laughed it off. But over time, she noticed how I would sometimes shiver in bed, lying awake in fear. Being the sweetheart that she is, she would hold me and tell me it would be all right. My wife became my protector. She became the one to keep my fears in check. Her face became that of an angel to me. One that would protect me from whatever scary things life had in store for me. I came to trust those beautiful green eyes. And every time I saw her, I knew I was safe. Now, to the more weird things that have been happening of late. The first incident that I can recall that could be defined as strange happened at 3am one night. I woke up feeling extremely thirsty, but being the fearful guy that I am, I grabbed the flashlight to get some water. As soon as I turned on the flashlight, I noticed my wife wasn't in bed. I looked over to the bathroom, and the light was on, and I could hear the water running, so I assumed she was there. Half asleep, I walked downstairs to the kitchen and almost had a heart attack when I saw my wife standing in a corner drinking water. As soon as I saw her, though, I felt safe. She smiled at me as she sipped the water from the glass. I was too tired, and I mumbled something about how hot it is as I got some water. She continued to smile at me as I finished my water and headed upstairs. As I walked back upstairs, I called out that she should come back to bed seeing as it's so late. When I got back to my room, there she was, sound asleep. This was the moment I became wide awake. I could have sworn that she was downstairs having water. Afraid to go back downstairs, I woke her up and told her what had happened. Half asleep, half upset, she comforted me and told me to go back to bed. The next morning she joked about how I'm so afraid of the dark that I see her everywhere as my protector. Besides, I was using the bathroom when you thought I was out of bed, she claimed. With that warm smile, how could I think otherwise? 
A week later, another strange incident. This was in broad daylight, well on a Saturday morning. Natalie woke me up at 11am and told me she was going to get groceries. At around half past 11, I finally got out of bed and dressed up for a late brunch with my beautiful wife. I went to the kitchen and found her drinking a glass of water. I smiled and said, Back so soon, honey. She didn't reply. She just smiled as she sipped on her water. Before I could approach her, the doorbell rang and I immediately went to see who it was. I opened the door. Yes, it was my wife, back with all the groceries. Oh, help me with all this, would you? She jokingly snapped as she put down the paper bags by the door. As soon as she saw my colour drained face, she knew something was wrong. She sat me down, got me some water, and I told her what had happened. This time it was in broad daylight, and I knew what I'd seen. As much as I'd come to adore her beautiful green eyes, for the first time, I saw in them a strange fear. My wife was the strong one, never afraid. She told me there's something she should have told me a long time ago. She said this happened to her as a kid, a lot. Where her parents and siblings would see her in places they knew she wasn't. They could never explain these occurrences, but seeing as it caused no harm, they came to live with it without really questioning these encounters. It took me a few months to process everything she told me, but I started to live with it too. Like I said, my true perception of fear was monsters, not my beautiful wife. Several similar incidents happened. For instance, I would see her sitting in bed, only to find her cooking in the kitchen downstairs. And in all these instances, when I would interact with this entity that I still saw as my wife, she would smile and not say anything. I actually came to find comfort in seeing my wife all the time. Always smiling, always happy, and always perfect. It is important to note, however, that in all of these incidents, there was never any overlap, meaning I never saw her in two places simultaneously. I guess any sane person would have called out to their wife when they thought they were seeing the entity, but, like I said, I found comfort in her green eyes, in her smiling face, so, honestly, I didn't really care. And then, today, everything changed. My wife told me she was going to visit her grandparents, who live in an hour away from where we do. She invited me to go, but seeing as it was a Sunday, and I just wanted to be lazy, I told her to go ahead without me. This is when it finally happened. The overlap. I was in my living room watching TV when I got up to get myself a Coke. There she was, my wife again, sipping water from a glass and just smiling. I was so used to it by now, knowing that this was the entity. I smiled and said, <laughs> nice to see you're still watching over me. She smiled and continued to look at me with those beautiful green eyes I'd grown so fond of. That's when the phone rang, and I turned away from the entity to pick it up. I'm going to run a little late since Granny insists on me staying for lunch. It was my wife, and as soon as I heard her voice, I heard a glass shatter, which my wife on the phone also heard. I turned around and saw that the entity was now glaring at me, the smile no longer there, but rather a very disturbing grin. She was pointing at me, with her head tilted at a perfect 90 degree angle, but that wasn't what disturbed me. It was her eyes. They were no longer the green that I'd found so much comfort in. They were pitch black, like those demons in the movies. I stared at her as I was at a complete loss for words. Honey, is everything okay? Did you drop something? My wife asked on the phone. I whispered back into the phone. I didn't. She did. At this point, my wife screamed into the phone. 
Hang up and look away. I don't know how I found the strength to do so, but I did exactly what she said. When I opened my eyes a split second later, she was gone. Confused and scared, I called my wife back, who said she was already on the way. It shouldn't have happened. It, it shouldn't have happened. They said it wouldn't. They said she was harmless. I'm too scared to just sit around and wait. I still keep looking over my shoulder. My wife should be home any time now. As soon as she gets back, I'll ask her who she meant by they, and what the hell is going on. She knows something, and I have to know what it is. Never did I think that the one I hold so near and dear to my heart, the one who protects me, could become the monster that I fear the most. When my wife Natalie got back, she came in crying and wouldn't stop. She kept saying, you, you don't deserve this. We don't deserve this. You weren't supposed to overlap. I love you. I care about you, your family. Oh, you shouldn't have overlapped. At this point, I was really confused. I comforted her, held her until she stopped crying. Then, when she finally settled, I asked, Love, you're not making any sense. Who is she? Are you referring to the entity? She told me that she doesn't have a name for it, and she's never actually seen her. Only others around her can see her sometimes, but she has always been described as someone who looks just like her. The same radiant smile and the same lovely green eyes. But when you screamed in the phone earlier, you knew that what I was seeing was... <laughs> you knew, didn't you? How? She looked at me and started crying again. Oh God, I only kept it from you because I didn't want you to freak out, she said. It's all right, just tell me everything, I replied, pulling her close. Then she told me the story of the last person who overlapped, meaning the one who saw her and the entity at the same time. When Natalie was in high school, her family, namely her parents and two brothers, were used to seeing it, well, as I call it for lack of better word, they were used to seeing it around the house. She was always described as a smiling girl who would usually just be sipping on water. This occurrence only seemed to happen in her house, never at school or outside. Her parents, knowing the situation, would never allow her to bring any friends over for fear that they might freak out when, for fear that they might freak out at what they see. But one day, upon her insistence, and arguing that seeing it has never done anyone harm, her parents let her bring over a friend. Natalie and her friend Chris were working on some homework when Natalie decided to go down to the kitchen and grab some snacks. While she was coming back up, she heard Chris saying, <laughs> Very funny, but you're weirding me out with that smile. Natalie stopped dead in her tracks, but it was too late. The door to her room was open, and she was in direct line of sight of Chris in the hallway. He turned to look at her, his face completely pale, as Natalie heard glass shattering. She was completely in shock. Chris was looking at them simultaneously. Staring wide-eyed in the corner of the room, she heard him say, What in the... Natalie ran towards her room, but the door suddenly slammed shut. She started banging on the door. Chris, don't look at her, just don't! She screamed across the door. But, silence. The door opened five minutes later, and she found him unconscious. After taking him to the hospital, they found out that Chris had gone blind. The doctors couldn't explain it. And when they asked Chris to describe the last thing he saw, he struggled for words. That, that grin, the, those eyes, black, black eyes. And her head, oh God, her head was tilted 90 degrees. I never thought such a beautiful face could be so twisted. She thinks the only reason I can still see is because the overlap happened over the phone. 
so I wasn't able to feel the full effect, whatever that means. I was surprised that another overlap like this hadn't occurred throughout her life. And that's when Natalie told me that they said she was harmless, and they will not actively try to overlap. So then, I inquired about the they that she just mentioned. Well, when I was a kid, my grandparents knew something about this. They were all very hush-hush about it, but apparently it had happened in the family once before. So it was clear then. We needed to go and see her great-grandmother, who was the only one left that could provide us with any answers. Natalie called her mum, and was told that they hadn't been in contact with their great-grandmother for the past two years. Ever since her husband died, she'd become depressed and had asked not to be contacted, and broke off all ties. She lived out in the country by herself, secluded from the rest of the world. It was going to be a three-hour drive, so we decided to attempt to get some rest in before our drive the next day. We barely got a few hours of sleep in. My wife woke me up this morning, telling me, Breakfast ready, as she walked downstairs. I noticed both of us must have missed our alarms, because it was 11am already. The first thing I checked when I woke up was the bed to make sure I wasn't seeing it. When I finally went downstairs, I nearly fell backwards when I saw my wife, sipping from a glass of orange juice, facing the kitchen entrance. Jeez, don't do that, I snapped. She came rushing towards me. Oh, sorry, she mumbled. I walked over and gave her a big hug. God, it's all right, we're both on edge. We'll work through this. After a breakfast that neither of us had the appetite for, we hit the road to find some answers. As we were driving, my wife held my hand, and I felt safe once again. It was a strange sense of security, because even after the crazy events, it was bright and sunny outside, and I was just peacefully driving away with my wife. She smiled at me. I smiled back, looking at her beautiful green eyes while fighting internally to take the image of the twisted entity off of my mind. We remained quiet for most of our journey, until we finally reached the house. The house was located deep off of a small highway, on a narrow dirt road. There was an old van parked, but it didn't look like it had been driven for weeks. The house also looked like it had been abandoned for a while. My wife reached out and I held her hand. Let's hope for the best and see what we find, I said. But before I could open the door, my cell phone rang. The moment the first ringing sound broke the quiet air, my wife clutched my hand just a bit tighter. She was on edge, I could tell. I looked over at her and she was smiling ever so slightly. I pulled out my phone, looked at the caller ID. It read, Natalie. The grip of the hand that I was holding started getting tighter and tighter. I suddenly got the feeling I was not with my wife at all. Call it a gut feeling. I picked up the phone as I realized the person in my peripheral vision was changing their expression. The breathing also got heavier as I heard the neck starting to turn. With what little bravery I had left, I turned away, not daring to see that twisted face. It's not me, Natalie yelled from the phone. The instant her voice reached my ear, I felt the glass shattering sound in a burning pain on my hand that lasted for a split second. I recoiled in pain, responding, I know, God, I, th I think he's gone now. I looked over to see, and sure enough, she wasn't there anymore. I breathed. Don't hang up and drive over here. We need to see this thing through. On her drive over, she explained how, when she woke up, she was seemingly stuffed under the bed, as if someone had knocked her out and slid her under there. When she woke up and realized that I wasn't there, she knew something was up and called immediately. 
At this point, I was freaking out a lot. So many questions rushed to mind. It talked. It acted just like my wife. How was it holding my hand? How in the world did it get out of the house? Most importantly, how do I tell it apart from my wife? That's when I remembered the stinging pain and looked at my hand. There was a very clear, lucky, burn into my hand. While I waited for my wife to drive over, I started thinking. The entity said, breakfast ready, and sorry. And why in the world was it sipping orange juice? Is it evolving? Is it learning how to fool me? I wondered for a long time what all this meant until my wife finally arrived at 5 p.m. It was getting dark, and I wanted to go to a motel and come back tomorrow. But my wife insisted that we at least check out to see if someone lives in the abandoned house. Before she got out of the car, though, she took the cigarette lighter from her car and burned it on her hand. I got very upset when she did that, but she said it might help me tell them apart. At this point, any idea of rationalizing this fear sounded great. We went and knocked on the door as the doorbell seemed broken. Oh, did you hear that? My wife looked at me, terrified. Hear what? I wondered. The scream. It sounds like someone is in pain. My instinct was to back out, and I really wish I had. But before I could do anything, my wife was opening the door, leading me in. I held her hand, while keeping one foot in the door. I was all too familiar with the classic door slams behind you in a creepy house to walk in completely. Inside, everything was dusty and full of webs. It was also unnervingly dark. As my eyes adjusted to the dark, I noticed that the house was completely trashed, with strange symbols scratched into the walls and on the broken furniture in a shade of red. Just then, my wife started feeling lightheaded and began to fall. Oh, I feel so dizzy, she mumbled. I immediately caught her as she passed out. Then, to my horror, as I looked up, I saw her in the hallway. I could barely make out her figure, but her finger was pointed at me, with her head tilted at that unnatural angle. I did not need to stand there until I saw the rest of her creepy figure. I immediately turned round while dragging my wife with me. The door behind us slammed shut, but luckily my foot was in the door. I groaned in pain from the impact and lunged towards the barely open door and crashed outside with my wife. I looked back, wishing she was gone, but she was still walking towards us, very slowly, very deliberately. The next moments were kind of hazy, as I was full of adrenaline. I somehow managed to throw my wife in the car and get in. As I looked in my rearview mirror, I saw her. Her mouth was now wide open, and she screamed. As I hit the accelerator, I heard what sounded like the windows of the house smashing. I drove for half an hour to a small motel to rent a room for the night. At this point, my wife is asleep, but I haven't slept at all. I dare not look away from her. And what does the message on my hand mean? Is it toying with me? Telling me I'm lucky my wife called to save me. Should I go into the house again with someone else? When my wife woke up, we had a long discussion on what our next step should be. While we were talking, I casually glanced at her wrist and noticed the burn mark was still there. She saw me looking, and her usual radiant green eyes became dull. It's me. I wish I could tell you not to be afraid of me, but... I don't even trust myself anymore. Tears started running down her face as I gave her a hug and comforted her without responding. She was right. 
I was starting to doubt the one person I trusted to protect me in any situation. Though I took some solace in the fact that she was still the one who saved me twice from the twisted entity. Besides doubting ourselves, we came up with a few theories that seemed to make sense in light of recent events. First, it seems that the entity is unable to appear in my wife's presence, proven by the fact that the moment she passed out, I was able to see it. Second, the entity is either evolving, since it was able to speak and move out of the house, or there might be multiple entities, as some of you have suggested. Third, technology could potentially be a weakness for this thing, as the phone call has saved me twice now. And finally, there's something very wrong with that house, and the entity definitely doesn't want us there. The house is something that has to be explored, but it's too dangerous to just go back without any further knowledge. So, we decided to talk with the only other person in Natalie's life who had experienced the overlap, her high school friend, Chris. After making some phone calls, we found out that Chris lived in a nearby town and had become a support group speaker for the visually impaired. It turned out he was actually speaking at 11am, and we still had enough time to be able to make it. We got to the small community hall just in time as they closed the doors. Most of Chris's speech was very uplifting and full of emotion, talking about all he had achieved in life. He ended his speech by saying, The day that I lost my vision was the day that I truly stopped living in fear. We stuck around after, and when the hall had emptied, we approached Chris, who was standing next to his wife, whom he had introduced earlier during his speech. I didn't know how to even begin to ask him about his vision loss. But before I could say anything, he pointed to me. Ah, so the overlap happened. She said you would come. He then went on to tell us that ever since the incident, Natalie's great-grandmother had been in close touch with Chris. She felt very guilty about what had happened, and was determined to find as much as she could. She also insisted that it was only a matter of time before the overlap happened again around Natalie, and she wanted to find a way to stop it. When we told Chris about the condition of the house, and about the symbols that I'd seen, he became very serious. Oh, and she tried to do it. She tried to bind what holds the sisters together to her house. I'm afraid she may not have survived that, he said quietly. I was really confused at this point. Did you just say sisters? I asked. Chris then told us to follow him home, as there was a lot we needed to discuss. While Chris's wife cooked us lunch, he told us about the day he lost his vision. So, I never told this to anyone except your great-grandmother. But that day that I lost my vision, before I passed out, I'm pretty certain I saw a second entity behind the one that I was staring at in disbelief. And as I drifted into unconsciousness, I heard a whisper. Feed. He went on to explain that Natalie's great-grandmother called the entity sisters, since she was certain there was more than one of them. Additionally, she believed that they feed off of our fears, and not just fear, but the greater the fear, the more attracted the entity becomes. This made sense, seeing as I've been afraid most of my life, and now I'm at the peak of my fear since the one that I saw as my protector has become the subject of my fear. After years of research into ancient lore, demonology, mythology and family history, Natalie's great-grandmother found a way to pin the sisters. That has to be why there were strange symbols in the house, and why the sisters didn't want us going near the place. She must have found a way to bind them there. However, Seeing as the entity still appeared and drove with me in the car, that means they are still able to move freely, but they might have a vulnerability in that house. All of this was progress, yet the thought of not knowing how to deal with these sisters was quite troubling. Lunch is ready, called out Chris's wife, as we made our way to the kitchen to enjoy a much-needed meal. Chris wanted this to end as much as we did, 
so he insisted that we spend the night with him for our safety. Considering I hadn't gotten any sleep lately, I welcomed the idea. We all stayed in the living room, and Chris's wife and I took shifts staying up to make sure nothing happened. I woke up at 3am, feeling thirsty yet again. I laughed at myself, as I thought maybe I have a medical condition of waking up thirsty in the middle of the night. I looked over at Chris's wife, since it was her shift to be on watch. Sure enough, she was awake and looking over at me with a gentle smile. I whispered, Water? As she pointed to the kitchen. I walked over, half in fear of seeing the entity again. The kitchen was, thankfully, empty, as I went to look for water in the fridge. <sighs> no cold water in the fridge. I figured they might have some bottled water in the pantry. When I opened the pantry, I saw that it was very spacious and dark. I went to turn on the light and saw something very unexpected and horrific. In the corner lay Chris's wife, tied up, seemingly unconscious. Then it all hit me. Lunch is ready. Those were the only words spoken by Chris's wife that day. I was so caught up in figuring out what was chasing us that I missed that fact completely. I rushed back to the living room to find my wife missing and Chris sound asleep. What ensued after is beyond bizarre. I woke up Chris and called the cops immediately. I knew they must have taken her to the house. I didn't have time to tell them my wife was missing, so I rushed out of the door and headed for the house. Yes, I know this was very stupid, but we do stupid things when our loved ones are in danger. It's just human nature. During the drive, I kept asking myself, how did I miss that? Why is the entity evolving so fast? God, it took another form. Is it because I wasn't supposed to survive an overlap, much less twice? Jeez, is it hunting me down? But why take my wife? I'm the one they want. I finally reached the house. It was now six o'clock in the morning. Before I could step outside my car, my phone rang. It was Natalie. Hello? Honey, are you okay? Where are you? I yelled as I picked up. Oh, I'm... I'm so confused. I thought we slept at Chris's house. I'm home. I'm home, please. Just come back. Oh, now I was really confused. Is that still my wife on the phone? Honey, your wrist. Before I could finish, she replied, Yes, there is still a burn mark on my wrist. And so, I decided to drive back. As I started reversing, I saw it. Standing in the window of that decrepit house, sipping water from a glass, smiling at me with eyes shining greener than usual. I left for home, frustrated and not understanding any of what was going on. On my drive back, I wondered. It knew I was going back to the house to look for my wife. It wanted to see me, but why? When I got home, Natalie came running and gave me a hug. I felt cold-hearted for doing this, but I immediately pulled out her wrist to find the burn mark on it. She looked up at me in disappointment. It is me. As I finally looked into her eyes, my heart stopped. Her eyes, they were dark black. The iris of her eye was no longer the beautiful green that I had come to find comfort in. They were deep black. Natalie has been crying a lot ever since she looked in the mirror, and I'm still processing all of what's just happened. It's been a complete day since her eyes changed colour, and there have been no more sightings of the entity. Life is seemingly normal. Not perfect anymore, but normal. Natalie is still herself, but seems to be a lot more of a serious person now. I spoke with Chris on the phone, 
and he told me that him and his wife were doing okay and haven't seen the entity since. At this point, I'm writing this update and, well, I'm not sure if I should go back to the house and investigate. But I can't help but think it wanted me to see its eyes that day at the house. It wanted me to know what it had taken from me. I don't even know if destroying the sisters will bring back Natalie's beautiful green eyes. With that said, I'm keeping a close eye on her. Just when I thought, maybe I'd found peace. Just maybe I could move on with everything. Things got weirder. Natalie's eyes remained black. After a couple of weeks of pretending that things were okay, I tried to talk to her about the whole situation. But she would always find a way to skirt around the conversation. Things have never really been the same. We eat dinner in silence. I wake up at night and find her staring at the ceiling. Enough was enough. I couldn't continue to live like this. I needed to find a way to fix things. And the only way I knew how was to go back to that disturbing house. I sat down with Natalie and we had a long conversation about everything that had happened. And she reluctantly agreed that we needed to go back to the house. Whatever these sisters were, we needed to confront them. So, before we headed to the house, we came up with a plan. A lot of you guys suggested that mirrors might help, so I made sure to bring a mirror with me. I mean, at this point, why not? Additionally, knowing how dark it was inside the house last time, I brought some night vision goggles. Now, the question about whether Natalie would accompany me on the trip or not. Considering that she has been my saviour every time, we decided it was best that she went with me. However, I wasn't going to let her enter the house under any circumstance. I've also taken your suggestion on making sure that it is her. Even though Natalie has been significantly quieter than before, I make it a point to ask her numerous questions and expect answers to make sure it's her. I can see the sadness in her eyes. How she knows that I've lost the complete trust I used to have in her. But she complies and responds to my questions, knowing it's the only way I can keep a straight head in this entire situation. We arrived at the house around 11am in broad daylight. Not that it made a difference since the house was dark as ever inside. Since it was a pretty remote area, I didn't feel bad hooking up a chain to the front door and pulling it off with my truck. I wasn't letting any door close on me this time. I had Natalie stand about ten feet away from the doorframe, so that she could still see me as I walked in. My theory was that these sisters seemed to be unable to face her, so as long as I maintain a good line of sight with Natalie, I half-heartedly hoped they wouldn't appear. With my night vision goggles activated, I stepped into the house, with Natalie nervously calling out from behind me, Be careful, honey. Even though so much had happened, I still found a sense of comfort in her voice. It'll be alright, I promise. We will fix this, I called back. The air was heavy inside the house, and I found it slightly hard to breathe, but nevertheless... I'd planned for this trip for quite a few days, and I wasn't about to back out now. I saw the symbols again on the walls, and I pulled out my phone and took some pictures. Everything in the house was trashed and dusty, except a small cupboard on the wall across the living room. So far I'd been walking in a straight line, maintaining vision with Natalie. But this cupboard seemed odd. It had too many symbols around it, and it was the only object in the house that seemed to be untouched. There had been no sign of the sisters. I'm going to go check something out real quick. I'll be back right away, okay? And called out to Natalie, who shook her head. Uh, okay, please just hurry. 
I want to leave already. I sprinted across the room and looked through the drawers. All were empty except the last one, which had a small pocket-sized leather-bound diary. I immediately put it in my jacket pocket and started back. Just then, I turned around to find the smiling face of my wife, with a glass of water in her hand and eyes that looked greener than ever. Honestly, for a moment I admired her beautiful green eyes, only to immediately snap out of it and realize this was the entity I was facing. I slowly began to walk past it in an arc. Just as I had passed her, Is everything okay in there? Natalie yelled from outside. The moment the sound of her voice reached me, I heard a glass shatter behind me. I knew what was going on, and in that adrenaline-filled moment, I said, screw it, I'm going to give this a shot. I pulled out the mirror, turned around, and held it in front of its face. Now I could see her through my night vision goggles, head tilted, grinning. It let out a scream and shattered the mirror in my hand. I slowly began to back up towards Natalie's line of sight, eyes closed shut. Just when I thought I was almost there, I bumped into someone. Then I felt a hand on my shoulder, and a face right next to mine. You came back to us, it whispered in my ear. The most disturbing part wasn't that my eyes were closed. It was the fact that it sounded like five people saying it at exactly the same time, with some deep and some higher-pitched voices. Then I felt another hand as I swung around to the ground with a force I could not comprehend. As I fell, I crawled towards what little light was coming through the door. I barely got far enough to see Natalie screaming outside and running towards the house. Stop! Natalie, stop! Don't come in! I yelled as she halted a couple of feet from the door. No, 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 not you two. They can't have you two. They they said that they, they wouldn't. At the time, I didn't really pay attention to what she'd said. I felt a hand holding my foot, knowing that they were trying to drag me out of her vision. I noticed my phone had fallen out. At this point, I became very dizzy, and I reached to unlock my phone. Even though it was dark, Natalie's face lit up on my phone screen background. Her beautiful green eyes, as radiant as ever. I gave her one last look as I began to pass out. But right before I passed out, I felt the hand on my foot release. I woke up at the hospital. As my blurry vision became clear, Natalie jumped at me and gave me a hug. Oh, thank God you're okay. Can you see? Look at me. Can you see? As she moved back, the first thing I noticed were her green eyes. They were just as radiant as they used to be. Your eyes, I mumbled. Natalie let out a scream of joy when she realized I could see. Yes, yes, honey, my eyes are okay. I feel like myself now. Oh, everything is okay. I had so many questions in that instance, but the doctor insisted that I rest. The next morning, while the doctors were completing all the paperwork for my discharge, I spoke to Natalie about what had happened at the house. She explained that, as I was falling unconscious, she ran into the house only to see that the sisters were staring at my phone screen. The instant Natalie saw them, they looked up at her. After a brief stare, they disappeared. She also told me that she was pulling me out of the house, and it started crumbling and collapsed to the ground as we barely made it out. Really? I thought to myself. Was it that simple? Then I remembered about the pictures I'd taken in the house, and I reached for my phone to look at them. What are you looking for, love? Natalie asked, as she saw me desperately going through my photos. I took some pictures in the house. But 
I can't find them, I replied as I wondered what had happened to them. Hmm, I don't remember you taking any pictures. She grabbed my phone and slid it in her purse. But we'll worry about that later. I'm just so glad you're okay. And she gave me a hug. She was acting a little strange. Did she delete the pictures from my phone? I noticed my jacket hanging on the door. The same one I'd worn when I went inside the house. I walked over to put it on. Oof, it's chilly in here. I smiled at Natalie. Just then the doctor called for her to sign some papers. And as she turned away, I immediately felt inside my pocket. I could feel the small leather diary. Ever since we've been home, Natalie has constantly been by my side, quite literally. The only time I was not with her was when I went to use the bathroom. I pulled out the diary and looked at the first page. Herein lies what little knowledge we have gained over generations since the birth of the sisters. I was about to flip the page when Natalie started banging on the door. Are you okay in there? Yes, I'm fine, honey. I'll be out in a bit, I yelled back. Hmm, something's not right. She won't leave me alone for one bit. Not to mention what she said before I passed out. She knows something, and she won't tell me. But I don't want to confront her just yet. I went to work today and tried to read the diary whenever I got the chance, but, well, I had a very busy day. The story is quite long, but I'm getting close to finishing it. Earlier today, I left work a couple of hours early and drove over to the supposedly demolished house. What I saw disturbed me. The house was burnt to the ground, as if someone had deliberately set fire to it. Why would Natalie lie to me? Did she set this house on fire? I'm also starting to doubt a lot of what she has said recently. Natalie keeps calling for me to come to bed. And, well, I'm in my study writing this update. I keep lying, saying I'm writing something for work. I also told her I have to go into work tomorrow morning for a few hours to make up for the time when I was in hospital. <laughs> she bought it. And, well, I'll be going over to a coffee shop instead to finish reading the contents of the diary. So, I'll pick up where I left off. When I finished my previous post, I went to bed, ready to go to the local Starbucks the next morning to finish reading the diary. Surprisingly, I actually fell asleep, all the while Natalie holding my hand and telling me everything was alright. I woke up at 3am again, feeling thirsty. By now, I've realised that this is not really normal. But then again, nothing has really been normal. I decided to go down to the kitchen and get a drink of water anyway. As I tried to slip my hand from Natalie's, she instantly woke up. What's wrong, honey? She inquired. Her eyes were not sleepy. It was as if... She wasn't really sleeping at all. Oh, nothing, love. I just need to get a drink of water, I replied. Before I even got out of bed, she was out of bed and ready to go down with me. She held my hand and walked me down to the kitchen as I got a glass of water. She was being overprotective. Too protective. Mind you, there wasn't anything really wrong with her. She was herself. I couldn't help but feel that she was making sure I would never see the entity again, which is why every chance she got, she tried to be around me. We went back to bed, and I fell asleep knowing that Natalie probably wasn't going to sleep at all. In the morning, she asked me several questions about why I was going to work. I made up some decent excuses. Sweetheart, I'll be fine. I thought you said it was over. They're gone, I told her. Yes, of course, but I just wanted to make sure. I just want to spend as much time with you as I can after all that's happened, she said, with an almost sad look on her face. 
I arrived at the Starbucks, ordered some coffee, and without further delay, pulled out the diary and began reading. Before I tell you about the contents of the diary, I want to make some observations regarding the diary itself. It was very old, leather-bound, almost falling apart. It had several different types of handwriting throughout, suggesting that it had been passed down and multiple people had taken notes in it. The notes within the diary were scattered, and I have tried my best to piece everything together. The diary began by telling the story of two sisters, who were born a year apart. The first was Madeline, born on March 11th, 1800. A beautiful girl with bright green eyes, she was the first child to her parents. The second daughter was born on March 11th, 1801. This seemed a little odd to the parents, but they didn't give it too much thought. Since their second daughter also had green eyes, like her older sister Madeline, they named her Carolyn. As they grew older, the parents realized that both Madeline and Carolyn were identical. And not just identical twins, they looked exactly the same. It was only later that the parents realized not only were the daughters born on the same day, they were both born at exactly 3 a.m. Initially, they went and saw several different doctors, but none of them could explain this strange phenomenon. All they could conclude was that this was a strange anomaly. Eventually, the entire family just accepted the strange phenomenon and continued on with their lives. Of the two sisters, Carolyn, the younger one, was very lively and energetic. She had a way with words, and all the townspeople were very fond of her. Madeline, the older sister, was quiet in nature. She didn't speak too much, and over the years had come to envy her sister Caroline. Caroline would sometimes pretend to be Madeline to confuse people. For the most part, the sisters were like any other siblings, with the usual conflict every now and then. Now, this next part of the story takes a dark turn. It turns out that both Madeline and Carolyn fell in love with the same man. Thomas was a very wealthy businessman, and they both got to know him because he worked closely with their father. Seemingly, Carolyn admired Thomas's wealth more than anything, whereas Madeline was in love with Thomas. Thomas chose to marry Carolyn not knowing that her affection wasn't real. Being the quiet one, Madeline didn't say anything. On their wedding day, however, when Madeline saw Carolyn getting ready to put on her wedding dress, she couldn't contain her anger and frustration and confronted her little sister. In a heated argument, she accidentally pushed Carolyn down the stairs, causing her to die. What happened next was even more bizarre. In a state of shock and emotional distress, Madeline hid her younger sister in the closet, put on Carolyn's wedding dress, and proceeded with the ceremony. Madeline got married to the love of her life, and proceeded to move forward with her life as if nothing had happened. A few days later, Carolyn's body was discovered. The reason they knew it was Carolyn is because the parents had secretly marked both sisters with two distinct burn marks on their backs. Once word got out, Thomas left Madeline in utter disgust. Madeline realized that her life was now ruined, realized what she had done, and hung herself. Now, I realize that Carolyn was always the one who smiled, the one who talks, and the one who can imitate people. Madeline, on the other hand, is the twisted form of the entity. So, at this point I ask myself, is that it? They're ghosts haunting the family. Well, not quite. The diary continued to explain what happened next. A generation later, the family was blessed with another beautiful baby girl named Laura. As Laura grew up, the rest of the family couldn't help but notice that she looked exactly like Madeline and Carolyn. 
Slowly, the family started seeing the entity, and strange things began to happen. Now the writer in the diary claims that they do not completely understand the origin of the overlap. However, they do know that it happens when the child experienced immense emotion. Now, I won't give you each and every detail from the diary, as the notes were quite extensive. The diary gave several accounts of different daughters being born in the family every once in a while that follow this same pattern. They look like Madeline and Carolyn, and things around them become strange. Over the course of the notes, the diary writer's understanding of the entity increases. All cases end with the sisters taking complete possession of the daughter or anomaly child, and then disappearing. Over the years, the family figured out that the original burn marks used by the parents to mark the two sisters could shield items from the sisters. However, this didn't work when the marks were applied on people. The notes went back and forth on what exactly the sisters were, until I arrived to the last few pages of the diary, which were written by Natalie's great-grandmother, at least that was my guess. Turns out, she was a neurologist. She theorized that the sisters were a part of the anomaly child. This is why no one ever found a way to end the sisters. They reside within the mind of the anomaly child. This meant that part of Natalie was the two sisters. Natalie's great-grandmother continued by saying that Natalie is not to blame. The sisters are able to communicate with her subconsciously. Therefore, she knows that they exist but is not completely aware of what happens around her. To my horror, I turned to the next page, hoping for a solution. The final words in the diary read, It's her. They are a part of her. In every past case, the final stage was complete control of the anomaly child's body by the entity. After which, the immediate people around the Anomaly Child would die, and the Anomaly Child would disappear. The sisters are entities that feed off of immense emotion. Unfortunately, we have tried, but killing the Anomaly Child does not end the cycle. They will be coming for me next, as they have seen the diary in my possession. I am hiding this diary with the prescribed markings. To whoever finds this next, I am sorry. Now, I wrote that last paragraph without telling you how shocked I was. Was this it? There was no solution? Is that why Natalie has been staying so close to me? Does she realize that she will eventually be lost to the sisters? How did she save me that day at the house? Did she actually interact with the entity? I closed the diary, my heart racing. I cannot lose Natalie. She is my world. She's everything to me. As I looked up, I realized it was almost dark. I'd spent nearly the whole day reading this diary. As I drove back home, I didn't know what to do. I did decide that I needed to confront Natalie and tell her about the diary, even though that probably didn't sound like the best idea. But, well, what other choice did I have? When I got back home, Natalie rushed into my arms, and I apologized for being so late. We had a nice dinner together, and afterwards she asked me if we could look at the stars for a while. Considering all the weird things that had happened lately, I gladly agreed to finally do something normal with her. Remember how we used to climb out to the roof of the engineering building on campus and stare at the stars? She asked, turning towards me. Yeah, and I still stand by what I said then. I don't really need to look at the stars when I can look into your beautiful love, I responded. I love you so much. Always know that, she said, and started crying. I held her as I couldn't help but think she knew exactly what was going on. That night I went to bed, fully intending to confront her the next morning. 
I woke up at 2.45 a.m. to Natalie quietly kissing my forehead. I pretended to stay asleep as I heard her walk downstairs. I quietly got up and followed her down. Then I saw her, holding a suitcase and walking towards the front door. Natalie, honey, what's going on? I called out. She turned, eyes full of tears. I have to go. I'm so sorry. I have to go. Please. I wasn't letting her go. I'd gone through too much for her sake. Natalie, I know everything. I started, but she kept glancing at her watch. No, you don't. I asked them to. I told them to take me, but to leave you alone. She screamed. Now, I was really worried. Natalie, what did you do? How did you get me out of that house? Natalie, I need you to be honest with me. For once, honey, trust me. She collapsed to the floor. I begged them. I begged them to leave you alone and take me. I've been fighting them for so long. I've been fighting to keep them away for so, so long. Half the time I don't even know who's in control. They agreed. They'll leave you alone only if I stop fighting them. But it's too late now. I'm no longer fighting them in my mind. I've given them control of my body. So, run. 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 As she said her last words, I began to notice strange inflections in her voice. Run. She screamed as she looked up, her eyes pitch black, her head starting to tilt, a grin slowly forming on her face. The clock behind her read 3 a.m. What ensued was probably the craziest thing I've ever done. But in hindsight, these last couple of months have made me a lot braver than I ever was. As she stood up, I rushed towards her and gave her a hug. I know you're in there, love. I know you've been protecting me all this time. You've always been my saviour, and now it's time for me to save you. Now it's time I protect you. Come back to me, Natalie. Come back to me. You're stronger than they are. Fight back. Fight back for me. Fight back for us. I love you, and I can't live without you. I held her, eyes shut close. Remember the stars. Remember how we stared at them last night. Remember how we stared at them all those years ago. Oh, I still think your eyes shine brighter than any of the stars in the sky. In that adrenaline-filled moment, I kept talking on about our most cherished memories until I felt tears falling down my shoulder. I finally had the guts to pull away from her to see that she had returned to being my Natalie. Eyes shining bright green, full of tears. I'm so sorry, she said, as I held her for a long time. After everything that has happened, I've realized that I was just so afraid of the world. I've always feared monsters that exist in my imagination. And the only person I saw that could shelter me was Natalie. <laughs> Little did I know that all along, she was fighting against something much more scary. She needs me more than ever, and I've finally come to see that. I've realized that I have to fight for the one I care for so deeply. I believe that in the moment that Natalie gave the sisters control of her body, they became vulnerable. Somehow. They seem to be trapped inside Natalie. Life is not going to be normal anymore, but I don't care. As long as I have Natalie, everything will be alright. It's been a week since, and things are starting to normalize. Still, sometimes at night, I wake up, and when I turn to look at Natalie, I see those pitch black eyes. But I hold Natalie's hand, and in the blink of an eye, her green eyes return, brighter than ever. Wow. 
what did you think of that one? Most things resolved at the end there, but a very intriguing story indeed. Did you like it? Let me know in the comments section below, and as always, I will do my best to reply to as many as I can. Been very busy recently, so I haven't done as much commenting as I would like, but, well, that's life. <laughs> well, I'll be back again on Friday with another fantastic story for you, and you know what? I really do hope you'll join me again. But for now, that's enough for me for one evening. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?